Hello everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. We've got another toast rack on the bench today. In fact, I've got two that have turned up at the same time, so here's the first of those two. This one appears to be in fairly good condition, although there's a missing keyboard membrane, I'm going to have to find one of them and replace it. The only thing I can see is it seems to have had a new ROM chip, as an EEPROM there. So, time to try the new Fluke meter, look what I got. No more messing around with that cheap one which gives me bad voltage readings when the battery's low. All I'm going to do is check the resistance between 5 volts and ground and between 12 volts and ground. The toast rack RAM chips only require plus 5 volts so we'll check that. We've got 515 ohms, that's probably okay. And let's check a 12 volt supply to a different chip. Resistance to ground is in the kilo ohms. So no shorts there in the power circuit, that's a good sign. With that checked, I'm going to measure the voltages and I am using my current limiting power supply which is maxing out at 1 amp, um, that's because I haven't got the setting quite right. Let's adjust that and increase our current limit a little bit, bearing in mind the 7805 maxes out at 1.5 amps, I've set it to about 1.2 and there we go, at 9 volts we are drawing 1 amp. Over to the fluke meter, let's go DC voltage measurements. First of all checking our 5 volt supply. This is auto ranging, which is nice, and it's telling me 4.95 volts. That's great. What about 12 volts? 11.91. Pretty happy with those values, so let's have a look what kind of display we're getting from the thing. Well, it doesn't look good until I press reset, and then it does look good. And that's repeatable. Every time I power it up first time, it's garbled, and then when I reset it, we seem to have correct operation. Yeah, I'm able to type as well. I'm using a donor keyboard here, by the way. I haven't replaced the membrane yet. So what about this cold start issue? In some ways, it's not the end of the world. It's not too difficult just to hit reset when you plug it in but it's not good enough really, it tells me something's on its way out, so we're going to try and figure it out. Before we start changing components, I've just been running a few diagnostic ROM cycles using the Dandinator, and it didn't pick up any problems, so let's open it up. Our first part of call with this issue is going to be capacitors. There's one specific capacitor we're interested in, but I think a full recap should be performed first. Normally I'd use my own supply of capacitors, but the owner of this has sent me loads of bits and bobs to work with, starting with all of these RAM chips, some more chips, sockets to go with those chips as well, and a audio mod resistor from Retrolium. In fact, I reckon all of these have come from Retrolium. But that's not all. We also have a bag of capacitors, another bag of capacitors, another bag of capacitors, and more capacitors, and more capacitors. So I think I'm alright for capacitors on this one. What else have we got in here? Oh yeah, plastic bits and bobs to put them back together again. By the way, when you're working with the board out of the case, you're going to need to plug a voltage regulator in. You can just take the heatsink off the case with the regulator attached, or if you have a switching regulator like this, you can just pop it into the connector as so. Anyway, I changed the capacitors out, I won't bore you with footage of that, we've done it a million times, and gave it a quick test, and unfortunately it didn't fix our issue. So this brings us to the schematic. Let's have a look at the Z80's reset mechanism in some detail. Sinclair introduced a reset switch with the 48k Plus machine, and the same switch carried over to the Toastrack 128k machine. The Z80 pin reset, which is active low, is pin 26, and our switch connects that directly to ground. We can actually close it here using Microsoft Paint simulation capabilities, there we are, to close. And what this does is it connects all of this to ground. This means the voltage at the reset pin goes to zero and our Z80 stops doing its job. It isn't until we open the switch again, like that, that the voltage on the reset pin returns to 5 volts and the Z80 starts all over again, fetching the instruction from address location zero. But why am I telling you this? Well, let's think about what happens when we first plug the machine in. Here's our 5 volt supply. 
When we first plug the machine in and 5 volts appears here, nothing happens initially as C26 charges up, but very shortly afterwards we have 5 volts on the top side of C26. Similarly, C27 conducts initially while it charges up, which means the reset pin's voltage climbs up from zero. This gives the rest of the board a little bit of time to settle down and charge up and get stable before the Z80 starts fetching instructions. So when the reset pin goes high, everything can start and we get a nice clean boot. Here's our one microfarad capacitor at C27. We're going to replace it with a slightly larger capacitance capacitor, which should hopefully give the board a little bit more time to initialize and we should get a nice clean boot. I'm deliberately not cutting this out because it's a new capacitor that I've fitted when I recapped it, so I'll keep that for later. I've been told 4.7 microfarad works, even 22 microfarad. Okay, drum roll please, here we go. Ah, it didn't work. I did try a couple of different values of capacitor as well, it didn't seem to fix it. So our problem must be elsewhere on the board. Maybe a chip with a very strange finicky cold start problem. I'm going to start by replacing the Z80, which now I'm editing the video I realise isn't a great idea because the Z80 seemed to be working perfectly once the machine was up and running. So yeah, chances were this wasn't it. In goes our new CPU. Yeah, that certainly hasn't fixed the issue. Next, I tried replacing the PCF multiplexer chip. On the bright side, I am getting some practice with removing chips. And in goes our replacement PCF chip. Sadly, this didn't work either. I did get a tip off that the problem might lie in our clock generation circuit. So here is our series resonant oscillator circuit. Definitely not reading that from the other screen. This particular design of clock circuit uses three inverters, which are found in the 74S04 chip and just for fun I decided to breadboard this circuit up to have a look at how it works and there's our lovely clock signal. I know the frequency is wrong here, this just happens to be the only crystal I had lying around loose. The clock comes from pin 6 of the chip and goes off to the ULA. Another interesting thing I noticed was you won't find this chip on a 48k board, you just have the crystal here, X1, hooked directly into the ULA. As you can see on this schematic, it goes in on pin 39. And the actual oscillator circuit is inside the ULA on the 48k machines and is achieved using transistors. Anyway, this is where the chip lives and I'm gonna remove this one, pop a socket in and try putting a new one in its place. Alright, I've got a good feeling it's going to work this time, here we go. Hey, it did! Amazing! Problem solved. Just a couple more jobs to do then, I need to clean the machine, I'll start with the edge connector. I like to use a fiberglass pen here to make it all nice and shiny. You might also prefer to use a rubber, or before our American friends get too excited, an eraser.
We'll also do the anti-jailbar mod, which involves replacing C7 and 8 and C28. Let's check that it's worked. Lovely, I don't see any jail bars there, so this one's off for a good test run. Thank you all for watching, stay tuned for more repairs coming soon.